Without further ado, I'd like to introduce Carol K. Baker, EDD. Dr. Carol K. Baker is Director of Curriculum for Science and Music for Community High School District 218 in Oaklawn, Illinois. Dr. Baker was a member of the writing team for the Next Generation Science Standards, NGSS, helping to develop the middle and high school physical science standards. She, she has worked with reviewers from the LEAD State Review Team and Adoption Team in Illinois. She works with the state officials on plans for Illinois NGSS adoption and implementation. Carol, let's get started. Thanks, Tim. Hi, everyone. I hope you are having a great Monday wherever you are in the country. Just a couple of things um, I would like to tell you about myself. Um, and Tim, thank you for that great introduction. As a curriculum director for a high school school district, my role this year has been to begin implementing the next generation science standards in our science courses. So part of what I will be sharing with you both today and tomorrow, if you're signed up for the webinar tomorrow as well, is some of the insights that I've gained over this past year in helping teachers begin the transition to teaching in the next generation science standards way. So let's get going, and I'd like to start with talking to you about what our learning objectives are for the day. So first of all, we're going to talk about examples of the science and engineering practices and the cross-cutting concepts. And we're going to talk about how to use the engineering practices as part of instruction, and also how to use the cross-cutting concepts to make connections within and across the, the disciplines. But before we get started, what I would like to do is find out a little bit more information about who you are that will help me make sure that I am addressing um, all of you in terms of what your grade level or your content is that you are currently teaching or if you are an administrator. So we have a poll. And the first of two polls will tell us a little bit about whether or not you are a teacher, a principal, a curriculum administrator, a trainer. Carol, we have that poll closed now, and it looks like you've got every single person is a teacher that responded. Well, wonderful. Wonderful. Well, that's good to know. Thanks, Tim, for that information. And we also have a second poll that we would like to do. And that second poll that we would like to do is to find out something about the grade level that you're teaching. So whether you're K through 5, 6 through 8, or if you're in high school, if you're biology, chemistry, or physics, also, how familiar you are with NGSS in terms of um, what you might know already, and also how much you know about the cross-cutting concepts. Okay, looks like we have a lot from 6-8, 34%. High school biology, chemistry is coming at 11%, high school 11%. Physics. Well, 
Well, great. It's good to know who the audience is out there. So I'll make sure that I spend a little bit extra time um, talking to those groups uh, that are participating today, although I am a little sad that we don't have anybody in K through 5. Um, but that's okay. So let's get started in talking about NGSS. So just a couple of introductory co comments that I would like to make about the science and engineering practices. So first of all, if you are just beginning to implement NGSS, one of the things to know is that a good place to start in implementing NGSS is to spend some time with the science and engineering practices. It's important to incorporate these science engineering practices, perhaps even in your current instruction, even if you are not completely transitioning to NGSS, but still working through your old science standards from your state, you could still begin to implement the science and engineering practices, and it is definitely something that I highly recommend that you do. It will certainly help when you do a complete transition. It will help not only you, but will help your students as well. It's really a good first step in transitioning to NGSS. With the teachers that work in my school district, I worked on this transition um, last year during the school year, we worked on just implementing the science and engineering practices. And Tim, if you are out there, I don't seem to have control to advance the slides. So if someone could perhaps, okay. there we go. Now I'm good. If you need more information about the science and engineering practices and you want to look at some grade level specific information, you can find that in one of the appendices on the Next Generation Science Standards website. This information is in Appendix F on the website. And like I said, here you will find more grade specific information that you can follow in order to see exactly to what depth each of these practices should be covered for your particular students. The idea of the science and engineering practices is that they will help teachers transition from teaching kids about science to teaching them to do science. These practices will make science come alive in your classroom. And you'll notice as we go through this, um, we've got an awful lot of high school teachers that are part of the webinar. And you will see that lecturing to students is not one of the science engineering practices, or I should say listening to lectures is not. And I can tell you from a practitioner point of view, that's probably been the hardest part that we've gone through in my school district this past year is transitioning away from um, a heavy lecture-based science education to a more active science education. So that will be one of the things that I'll be talking a little bit more about and highlighting as we go through this. So the first science engineering practice is asking questions and defining problems. A practice of science is to ask and refine questions that lead to descriptions and explanations of how the natural and design worlds work and which can be empirically tested. Engineering questions clarify problems to determine criteria for successful solutions and identify constraints to solve problems about the design world. Both scientists and engineers also ask questions to clarify ideas. The struggle with working through these science and engineering practices is that these are practices that we are expecting students to do, not teachers to do. And as educators, we are often the ones that are doing the asking of the questions. If my teachers were here right now, they would tell you that this is the most difficult practice for them to get through at the high school level, because at, at this point, students are waiting for the teachers to ask the questions, and they are not in the habit 
of thinking deeply and asking the questions on their own. I think for younger students, especially those in elementary school, they're the ones that come to school every day with five questions that they want to ask the teacher the moment they walk in the door. So I think it's actually a little bit easier for younger students, but somehow as students get older, either they become quieter in the classroom or we have so much to do we don't listen to them as well. One success measure that we have found works very well for us this past year is to have students observe a demonstration or a video clip or an activity and writing statements about what they're seeing and then doing the second step of taking statements and turning those into questions. We have found that that is helping our students in the process of learning to ask deeper and more thorough questions on their own. Developing and using models is the second science engineering practice. This practice is to use and construct models as helpful tools for representing ideas and explanations. These tools may include diagrams, drawings, physical replicas, mathematical representations, analogies, and computer simulations. Modeling tools are used to develop questions, predictions, and explanations, and to analyze and identify flaws in systems. Models are used to build and revise scientific explanations and proposed engineering systems. Measurements and observations are used to revise models and designs. The key here is that you're taking learning to the visual level. What we have learned is that there is higher cognitive engagement when students have to turn the written or the spoken idea into a visual, into a visual representation. So those of you who may be thinking that, you know, are we talking about bringing back things like poster projects, I would say 100% yes. This is about teaching students to take ideas that you're talking about in class or ideas that are in their heads and drawing them, making a physical three-dimensional model out of it, doing computer modeling, whatever your resources are, whatever materials your students have to use, it's about making the written or the spoken word into a visual representation. If students can draw it or create it, they are more likely to understand it at a deeper level and remember it for a longer period of time. Planning and carrying out investigations. A scientist and engineers plan and carry out investigations in the field or laboratory working collaboratively as well as individually. Their investigations are systematic and require clarifying what counts as data and identifying variables or parameters. Engineering investigations identify the effectiveness, efficiency, and durability of designs under different conditions. In science over the years, we've been pretty good about carrying out investigations with our students. However, we have not done a very good job of helping students plan their own investigations. One of the ways that we have found is a good way to get students in the mode of planning their own investigation is to take students through an investigation that maybe you have planned first and ask the students to come up with an extension on their own or give them the parameters of an extension and then ask them to write their own investigation within those parameters. The idea here is that students start to build skills that will allow them to solve problems in the future even when formal schooling has ended. The idea of being able to plan thoroughly how to attack a problem and go through a process for solving it is extremely important as our students grow into adulthood. Analyzing and interpreting the data. Scientific investigations pr produce data that must be analyzed in order to derive meaning. Because data patterns and trends are not always obvious, science use a range of tools, including tabulation, graphical interpretation, visualization, and statistical analysis to identify the significant features and patterns in the data. Scientists identify sources of error in the investigations and calculate the degree of certainty in the results. Modern technology makes the collection of large data sets much easier, providing secondary sources for analysis. 
Engineering investigations include analysis of data collected in the tests and designs, and this allows comparisons of different solutions and determines how well each meets specific design criteria, that is, which design best solves the problem within given constraints. Like scientists, engineers require a range of tools to identify patterns within data and interpret the results. Advances in science make analysis of proposed solutions more efficient and effective. In science classrooms, traditionally, we have done a pretty good job of collecting the data as students work through laboratory investigations. But notice that this particular practice is not about collecting the data, it's about the analysis and the interpretation of the data. Very often in the science classroom, we can spend an entire class period on just the collection. And the questions that we ask students about the, the data is often an afterthought. Or because of time constraints, we often send students home with those questions and say, finish these questions for homework. So what we need to keep in mind when it comes to this practice is that the focus here is not on the collection of the data, but it's on the analysis of it. And what we have been doing in the classrooms that I observe is we have been taking time, sometimes even an entire additional day, just to look deeply at the data, to compare from lab group to, to lab group, and even sometimes to go back and redo an experiment because we may have question, received questionable information um, from a previous experiment. So again, the focus here is on the analysis of the data. Carol, we have a quick question yes. about um, one of the comments is, this year we sure. had no money for science materials. How can we do this with minimal investment is the first question. And our, our students are not much better off financially. OK. So just because um, there are ways to analyze the, the data using technology, it does not necessarily mean that that's the only way that you can do it. What's more important here is not the tool that you're using, but the practice of having students take a look at a graph. So even if they have to create the graph on their own, if they don't have a computer where they can use a program such as Excel to create it, if they have to draw it on their own, the emphasis here is that students spend time looking at the relationships between the variables and talking deeply about what those relationships tell you about a next process in the experiment, or how those variables may continue to interact with each other. Another really, really great thing that you can do in the classroom is um, to use some of our news and scientific periodicals and newspapers that often show graphs, and you can bring those into the classroom. Um, there are lots of good news magazines out there that often show um, graphs of all different kinds, and just bringing those into the classroom and having students spend some time looking at those is a great thing to do. Thank you. Our next practice is using mathematics and computational thinking. In both science and engineering, mathematics and computation are fundamental tool tools for representing physical variables and their relationships. They're used for a range of tasks, such as constructing simulations, solving equations exactly or approximately, and recognizing, expressing, and applying quantitative relationships. Mathematical and computational approaches enable scientists and engineers to predict the behavior of systems and to test the validity of such predictions. It's important here for students to understand that math is an extremely important tool for the use in science and engineering, and that students really gain an appreciation and understanding of how important math is, um, not only to them now as a student, but also to them in the future as they progress through their K through 16 education. Constructing explanations and designing solutions. The goal of science is the construction of theories that provide explanatory accounts of the world. A theory becomes accepted when it has multiple lines of empirical evidence and greater explanatory power of phenomena than previous theories. 
The goal of engineering design is to find a systematic solution to problems that is based on scientific knowledge and models of the material world. Each proposed solution results from a process of balancing competing criteria of desired functions, technical feasibility, cost, safety, aesthetics, and compliance with legal requirements. The optimal choice depends on how well the proposed solutions meet criteria and constraints. So in the classroom, what we want students to be able to do is to be able to explain the science that they're doing. Sort of like taking that lab conclusion and expecting students to really be able to embrace it and perhaps even present it in a more formal way. And of course, in the engineering, being able to design and talk about solutions to a particular problem. One of the things that we have implemented in our school district to help us move along this continuum is that every time we do a laboratory investigation, we ask a group of students to stand up in front of class at the end of class and just talk about what they did during the lab and what they learned. It's just a very simple thing to do to get students in the practice of really reflecting on what activities they're performing in the science classroom and what they've learned from those activities. And again, it's taking perhaps the written word or the spoken word into a new level. So in the past, we may have asked students to simply write a lab conclusion. And sometimes um, a student puts it on paper and then minutes afterwards cannot recall it, or maybe even students are copying from one to another and don't have a, a good feel for or a good understanding of what they're really writing. But if you ask students to talk about it so they can talk about it with each other, they can present to the entire class. But when you ask them to do that, it takes the, the knowledge and the concepts to a deeper place. In one of the classrooms I've observed just recently, a teacher was asking students to present to each other, even within their own lab groups, just to give everybody a chance to really talk about what they learned. So think of ways where you can have students talking to each other and explaining the science that they're learning so that they're getting it to a deeper level in their own minds. And I think if you all pause for a moment and just recall what it was like when you became a teacher, I'm sure you will all agree with me that the very first year or maybe the first few years of teaching were always the years where you learned the most science because in order to be able to explain the science to your students, you had to have a deeper understanding of it yourself. So simply by modeling that pr practice with your students, and asking your students to do the explaining will help them learn the science at a deeper level. Engaging in argument from evidence. Scientists and engineers must be able to communicate clearly and persuasively the ideas and methods that they generate. Critiquing and communicating ideas individually and in groups is a critical professional activity. Communicating information and ideas can be done in multiple ways using tables, diagrams, graphs, models, and equations, as well as orally in writing and through extended discussions. Scientists and engineers employ multiple sources to obtain information that is used to evaluate the merit and validity of claims, methods, and designs. Engaging an argument from evidence, as you can imagine, is very, very highly tied to the Common Core ELA standards. One of the greatest recommendations I can make to all of you is um, to walk down and visit with the English teachers in your school and talk to them about how they are teaching the skills of engaging in argument in their classrooms. Because what you'll want to do is make sure that you're modeling that same process for the science classroom so that students are not confused or so that students are not seeing different ways of preparing. The idea of engaging in argument is extremely important to 
myself and the other writers of NGSS because we feel it's extremely important for students in science to learn the skill of using evidence to support their ideas or to support their, um, their argument about a particular scientific idea. There are an awful lot of um, emotional opinions uh, out there, and there are also a lot of political scientific opinions out there as well. And the goal here is that we need students that are moving to adulthood and will be the next uh, members of our adult community in the future to be able to engage in a scientific conversation using evidence from sources as opposed to using emotion or opinion. So the skill of being able to develop an opinion that is based on evidence that can be argued is an extremely important skill. Also embedded within this is being able to engage an argument in a polite way. That is to teach students to as much as they can remove the emotion and stick to the facts that support their argument as opposed to becoming upset and um, as opposed to um, talking impolitely to another classmate. So lots of good stuff in this one. We have a so I have a more. question for you. Oh, OK. Go right ahead. We did have a couple more comments. Uh, one of them was a question that said, how do you balance between providing students with a knowledge base versus using that knowledge? And I think the comment that follows goes with this. It says, I'm afraid that if students are not getting enough science core information, how are they going to be able to come up with meaningful questions if they lack the scientific background? That's a really good question. And I can, um, I think I can assure you that um, what we are finding is now that we have somewhat relaxed our need to lecture at students and spend more time um, allowing students to go deeper into an idea, we're finding that these science engineering practices are really coming alive in the classroom. Um, now that we are asking students to do more and think more, they're coming up with more ideas on their own, and they're taking ownership of doing some of their own research, even outside of the classroom. Um, I guess it's, it's a way to say they're simply more engaged in the science than they ever were before. So, um, and, and I think I would also say that, um, you know, we've cut back a little bit on the content, but because we're going so deep, so deeply into the content, um, I think it more than makes up for eliminating that surface level knowledge that many state standards had in the past. So by asking students to go deeper, there's actually more to think, do, and question about than there was before. Thank you. So we have one last practice to talk about, and that is obtaining, evaluating, and communicating information. And this practice takes that last practice of argumentation one step further. Scientists and engineers must be able to communicate clearly and persuasively the ideas and methods they generate. Critiquing and communicating ideas individually and in groups is a critical professional activity. Communicating information and ideas can be done in multiple ways, using tables, diagrams, graphs, models, and equations, as well as orally, in writing, and through extended d discussions. Scientists and engineers employ multiple sources to obtain information that is used to evaluate the merit and validity of claims, methods, and designs. So again, and I love this, this, this picture of um, this young girl obviously explaining something to her classmates. And this is exactly the kind of thing that we want to ask you to model in your classroom. Situations where students are talking and explaining information to others is an extremely important skill. Um, working on those presentation skills that you are using every day 
asking your students to do it instead is extremely important and using PowerPoints, graphs, a diagram, a model, whatever they need to have to help them explain the information is extremely important. And the other thing to keep in mind is that you don't necessarily need to turn these into major projects where the students have to spend many days creating a presentation. One of the things that we are employing um, in our classes are things like quick PowerPoints where you tell the students they've got to come up with four slides and you give them a few ideas of criteria of what needs to be on those slides. It doesn't need to be a 20 slide PowerPoint, just a few slides. And again, just asking groups of students to get up in front of class for just a few minutes, not the entire class period, but just for a few minutes to talk about something. It just helps those skills of presenting. And also, um, as I mentioned earlier, if students are talking about what they're learning, that means it's going into a deeper place in their brain. The idea here is to get the students to start doing more of the talking and you as a teacher doing less of the talking. So now we've come to a point where I have a question for you. Um, I'd like to know from you, which of the science engineering practices do you think is going to be most challenging for you to implement in your classroom and why? And I'll pause for a few minutes here so that you guys can um, enter in some responses. Please feel free to use the questions area to enter in your answers during this time. Okay, I think we've come up with a few responses. Oh, I think we're getting a couple more. I'll start reading through some of these. Uh, getting the students to ask the questions will be difficult because up to this point they are used to uh, being led in learning instead of leading the learning. I um, agree 100%. Another question, comment is forming arguments, uh, forming argument because students do not always see both sides of the argument in the way CCSS wants them to. Uh, another comment, most challenging, engaging the argument from evidence, time constraints, and also lack of background knowledge, uh, of mac of, excuse me, of background knowledge students come to me with. Planning and carrying out an investigation. Most of my students have zero background in science. Planning investigations. Teachers haven't had a great deal of experience giving over control to students. And we'll just read about three more of these. Um, I don't have one specific practice that I feel will be a problem. However, being able to put them all together in the 45 minutes that we have in time uh, to teach to students about doing science and having them to discuss amongst their peers, how can I implement this strategy? And there's, don't know yet, is a response. Um,
And last one, uh, recognizing how evidence correlates to the concept. Please feel free to keep adding uh, comments as we can keep uh, this for later on, I do believe. So, um, Tim, one, one um, comment I would like to make based on um, some of the feedback that you just shared um, about helping students with the practice of engaging in arguments. Sometimes it's very difficult to see two sides of something when it's happening in real time um, because very often it's difficult to keep the emotion or the opinion side out of it. Um, what we have found has been very helpful is to pick something that was controversial but from the past and sort of use that as um, a training piece for s students. So for example, um, you could pick something like um, when there was a debate about whether or not the Earth was the center of the universe. And you can go back and look at the evidence that was used on either side. And even though we know what the right answer is for today, it's still helpful for students to go back and look at um, the information or the evidence on both sides and why one eventually won out over the other. Um, it's just a way of kind of training the students in using something that happened in the past as a training piece as opposed to trying to have them analyze something that is happening currently which may be more difficult to find two sides of evidence. So just a, just a little help there about something that we have tried. Um, and then just one other comment, that the science and engineering practices um, are not meant to be something that you have to cover all of them in every single class period. Um, some of the performance expect each of the performance expectations highlights a particular science and engineering practice that we want teachers to really focus on. On the way to teaching each of those performance expectations, we would also expect that teachers would employ some of the other science and engineering practices, but we certainly wouldn't necessarily be expecting um, all the science and engineering practices to come alive during one particular class period. The other part um, that I want to mention kind of that goes along with that is that you will find as time goes on the employing the science and engineering practices will become easier in the classroom. Um, the first year or two it, it may feel difficult um, for you and for your students to be um, going through a science lesson where they are more active participants and they are doing more of the science, but as time goes on, students will be coming to you um, having done these practices in the prior grade levels, so it will feel easier and you will feel more comfortable with it as time goes on. It's just that the first year or two of transitioning to doing a more active science in the classroom is going to be um, a challenge at the beginning, but easier as time goes on. Okay, Tim, let's transition now to talking about um, the cross-cutting concepts. So the cross-cutting concepts can be used as a way to organize the science concepts that students progressively learn throughout their K-12 experience. The idea of using cross-cutting concepts is that students are going to make connections both within a discipline and then across from year to year to year about the science knowledge that they're learning. It might be helpful to think of the cross-cutting concepts like file folders in your head. So in the elementary grades, think of the elementary teachers as helping students sort of set up these file folders in their heads. And then as students progress through their science education, the cross-cutting concepts help link and organize the science that they're learning into these themes or into these folders. And then the content and skills in these 
folders will build progressively from grade to grade, year after year. And if students begin to organize the science in this way, they will remember them more easily, and it will help them access this prior knowledge when they get to more difficult topics in higher grade levels. So we'll take just a few moments going through each one of these. The first one is patterns. Observe patterns in nature guide organization and classification and prompt questions about these relationships and underlying causes. A good example of how cross-cutting concepts works can be used by taking a closer look at what we mean by understanding patterns. If you help students in younger grades see the patterns in nature, then when they get to higher grades and you bring to them something more complicated, it will make more sense to them. Here's an example. If in younger grades you do an activity where students can see that the same set of building blocks can be used to make several different objects. For example, you can use Legos and you can give each student 10 or 15 Legos to use and the students can see that each one of them has been given the same set but if you ask students to put them together you will likely see that they come up with a variety of different structures. If students understand this concept at a very young level, then as they get older, when we get to something much more difficult like the periodic table, and if a teacher says the periodic table is a pattern, and this pattern uses a set of blocks, and everything that exists in our world is made of those blocks, students can recall the activity that they did all the way back in elementary school, and suddenly the idea that elements come together to form the variety of materials that we use every day will make so much more sense to them simply because a teacher in elementary school helps them understand that when you take a small set of blocks you can still create a variety of things and then when they get to high school chemistry and beyond they have an easier time understanding the building blocks of the periodic table. So that's an idea of how we want the cross-cutting concepts to work. So we want teachers to start talking about and using these cross-cutting concepts as they're teaching in the younger grades and then continue to build on that knowledge as time goes on and sort of taking the, the science and organizing into these themes that we call cross-cutting concepts. The next cross-cutting concept is cause and effect. Events have causes, sometimes very simple and sometimes multifaceted. Deciphering causal relationships and the mechanisms by which they are mediated is a major activity of both science and engineering. Scale, proportion, and quantity. In considering phenomena, it is critical to recognize what is relevant at different sizes, times, and energy scales, and to recognize proportional relationships between different quantities as scales change. Systems and system models. A system is an organized group of related objects or components and models can be used for understanding and predicting the behaviors of systems. Energy and matter, flows, cycles, and conservation. Being able to track energy and matter flows into, out of, and within systems are ways to help understand the behavior of a particular system. Structure and function. The way that an object is shaped or structured determines many of its properties and functions. And lastly, stability and change. Stability and change is about understanding that for both designed and natural systems, conditions that affect stability and factors that control rates of change are critical elements to consider and understand. So again, as I said a few moments ago, these cross-cutting concepts are ways to organize science into themes 
and into file folders in a student's mind. And the idea here is that over time, they will understand science at deeper and deeper levels because of being able to organize these ideas. It will help them engage their prior knowledge, and it will help them organize their thoughts and the science content that they are learning into thematic, organized folders that will help them progress into deeper and more difficult content as they move through their K through 12 education. So I have another question for you. And my question is, do you think that you might already be using any of these cross-cutting concepts in your classroom to help students make connections across and within science content? If you do, please take a few moments and share which one and how you are using it. Again, please feel free to use the questions feature to add that and add your suggestion. I'll start reading a few of these as they come in. Uh, it says, we use the idea of stability and change to teach ecosystems and evolution of habitat. I have the students compare the different cycles as we learn a new concept. I frequently use patterns, how one concept is like another. Uh, for example, cycles in nature. Another user says, I teach earth science, and we construct diagrams all the time and use models very frequently. You know, Tim, I think one of the challenges of NGSS is that um, I talk to many teachers who um, have read through NGSS and feel a little overwhelmed. Um, but I can assure you from my own experience that once you really start to take it apart and reflect on your own teaching practices, you will find that there's many of these things that you're already doing in the classroom. Um, you are all excellent teachers and you have all been trying to get students to do real science um, for many years now, and NGSS is a way to to support and maybe make um, the practices of doing science a little bit more concrete. And um, surely you will see that you are doing many of these things already in the, in the classroom. And perhaps to, to get them to the level of NGSS might only require for some of you some tweaking of current things that you are already doing in the classroom. The idea here is that um, NGSS is really a three-dimensional package, and those three dimensions are the content, the cross-cutting concepts, and the science engineering practices. And the idea here is to make sure that you are spending just as much time teaching students to do the science and to make connections within the science as you are having them learn the content part of science. So all three of those pieces um, need to be integrated and um, need to become part of your classroom instruction. And Tim, do we have any other good comments out there? Yeah, we've had a few more come in as you were explaining. There were, uh, I've used the Lego activity with high school students, only we extend it so that they need to write the instructions on how to build their model. It makes them think about what is relevant, their thought process, and practices how to write directions. Uh, there is also, I use patterns quite a bit. It seems to be patterns is a very good uh, 
thing to be using. I use patterns quite a bit when teaching the structure of atoms and the periodic table. Uh, let's see here. Stru structure and function is often used in teaching biological systems and concepts. Let's see. I'll we'll read a couple more here. Um, we use the idea of stability and change to teach ecosystems and evolution of habitats. Uh, we do actually have a couple uh, requests. Uh, I need more explanation and concrete examples of the cross-cutting examples to develop my own schema of what they are. Would you be willing to address that? So um, I know in our um, shortened time today we don't necessarily have an awful lot of time to go deeply in, into each one. What I think what I would recommend at this point is um, if you go to the Next Generation Science website and um, you went to the, the appendices, there is also a detailed appendix on the cross-cutting concept um, and that will probably provide you with some additional information. That appendix is appendix G as in good. So that's another place where you can go as a resource. Um, another thing that I would highly recommend if you haven't already d done so is to read uh, the conceptual framework that can be accessed on the Next Generation Science Standards website as well. It can also be found on the National Academies of Science w website. It was the um, precursor to the creation of the science standards, and there is um, a deeper explanation of using the cross-cutting concepts in that document as well. And um, so that's another place where you can find a little bit more detailed information about each one of those. Thank you very much. And then just one more comment I have. Um, so if you find that you already are using one of these cross-cutting concepts in your classroom, several of you mentioned using patterns and using structure and function. Use that as a building block to develop these other sort of file folders for students um, for the other cross-cutting concepts. So think of the ways that you've used patterns and the ways that you've used structure and function and dig deeply into the other cross-cutting concepts and build th those out as well. But use what you're already doing as a good way um, to lead into the development of the other cross-cutting concepts. OK, so we are um, wrapping up here. So just to summarize what we've talked about today, um, we talked about some examples of the science engineering con uh, practices and the cross-cutting concepts. And we talked about using the engineering practices as part of instruction and how to use the cross-cutting concepts to make connections within and across um, the subjects and the d disciplines that you're teaching. And I believe we're going to take a few extra moments to take some additional questions before we wrap up for the day. Yeah, we do have a couple questions that came in. And I do want to thank the panel, uh, the other um, members in the community. Uh, they were uh, giving ideas with all the some of the other members as well throughout this. And uh, but some of the questions we still have. Um, one question was, how did this apply? And uh, when we are being asked to teach about the human body, how do uh, how do yes, how did this apply when we are asked to be when we are being asked to teach about the human body? So I'm not sure I completely understand the question. Is that referring to maybe the cross-cutting concepts or, um, it, or is that it, in general using the science engineering practices? I think it was in general in using the, the science practices. Okay, so um, if, the, if the question is, um, the fact that we can't necessarily experiment on, on, the, on humans. So I'm assuming that's, that's where the question is, or the, the background that the question is coming from. Um, so just because you can't necessarily experiment um, on, on a human does not mean that you still can involve the science engineering practices in learning about the systems of the body. So um, for example, 
um, you can still do research, you can still have students construct explanations, um, you can still have students come up with solutions to problems and health and diet and, and things like that. Um, you can also look at simulations. There are an awful lot of computer simulations out there um, that model the processes of the body, so I would highly recommend using those as well. Um, as a matter of fact, that's probably one of my greatest recommendations to all of you is to do some searching um, and using and finding as many computer simulations as you can because I do believe that eventually um, if there is a large-scale assessment that goes along with NGSS, it will likely use a lot of things like computer simulations. And this allows us to be able to um, see science that we wouldn't normally be able to see if we don't have the necessary resources or lab materials. And especially like the body of humans where you can't, you can't explore the body of a human and you can't experiment on it. This allows us to look at how those systems work um, from a computer simulation standpoint. Thank you. Uh, I think we have time for one more question. And it says, uh, how is NGS going to be rolled out to ensure that the less content, this was dealing with uh, the less content and deeper uh, uh, understanding, how will, uh, to ensure that the less content will be met with this more process and allow students to be successful. In other words, what happens when students come to us with great process skills, but weak or weaker content background? So um, I think one of the important things to, to keep in mind um, about how the world has changed, um, and I'll just talk for, for a, a moment about what, what the world was like when I graduated from college. I graduated in 1988, and um, I remember being in college and being in a situation where my college professors were very interested in making sure that I retained an awful lot of science content. And the idea here was that um, in order for me to be able to um, to be a science teacher, I would need to know an awful lot of science information knowledge and facts because if I didn't know it, if it wasn't already in my head, trying to find it was a difficult thing to do. Encyclopedias were always out of date. Um, there were not always the resources in the library that you needed to have to look something up. So the finding of information was difficult many years ago. And most of the standards that are currently being used around the country were developed in the middle 1990s which means that they were conceptualized really in the late 1980s. So just about the time that I was finishing up college, that's when many states were writing their standards all around the country. And these standards were very, very, very heavy content based. And again, it's because finding information, if you didn't learn it in school, was a very difficult thing to do. Fast forward to 2014. The, the science content out there has grown tremendously. It's impossible for us to expect students to know all the content that's out there. And because we live in a society where a student can pick up a smartphone and look up something instantaneously, and they will be able to do that for the rest of their lives and even more efficiently than they can right now, which is sometimes um, difficult to even conceptualize, but ideally, information will continue to be at their fingertips. So what we need to do as teachers is to move away from asking students to, to memorize vast amounts of information, but yet instead teach them how to analyze this information, how to interpret it, um, how to use it, how to share it, how to communicate it with others. So focusing again on the practices of science, we're still using the content of science to do this, we're just not going to ask students to memorize the volumes and vol volumes of knowledge out there because it's impossible, but teach them how to go out and find what they need and be able to use that information. That's what NGSS is all about. Thank you, Carol. We're going to have to wrap up. There has been very, um, there was just great discussion in the questions board and lots of great questions that 
uh, we I wish we could have gotten to at the but this is being recorded um, so thank you for attending this webinar a survey will pop up at the end of this webinar we are so grateful for your feedback and so we can improve the experience for future webinars uh, you will receive a follow-up email containing a recording of today's session and evidence of your participation which you may use towards continuing education units or CEUs. Uh, if you have any additional questions, feel free to email webinars at mheducation.com. Uh, you can learn more about the Next Generation Standards at https www or colon uh, forward slash forward slash www.meheonline.com forward slash ngss forward slash and uh, Actually, could you afford that uh, slide, Carol, for us? And they could get a view of that. And I uh, just wanted to wish everyone a great evening this evening. Thanks, everybody. Have a great end to your school year.